because the World Cup is right around the corner. Yes, because the World Cup is right around the corner, I think we should say we'll kick the football, because we're in Europe, kick the football, not the soccer ball, forward a little, uh, in terms of the data modeling and uh, implementation. So we'll have three talks, and then we'll have time to talk uh, as a discussion as, uh, as the group. So who's the first speaker? Oh, right, it's me. It's not supposed to be me, but I will do my best. Should I be nervous that I don't see that on the screen? Just saying. Okay, let's move forward one. So uh, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about uh, representation of object provenance uh, for research in natural science objects, which involves samples, parts, derivatives in what our sort of DNA collection management slash research management system that we're working on. You can see here are some of my uh, collaborators on this, uh, mostly a joint venture between uh, the Museum for Natural Kunde in Berlin and my institution, Agriculture and Age of Food Canada. Right. So when it comes to research, we know that in our collections, we have all kinds of interesting objects to work on, as well as all kinds of ways to track the data slash metadata about those objects. We also now have all kinds of methodologies associated with how those things got in there and what we do to them, to those objects. Uh, some of which are very modern, like the DNA kind of seeks a part, but others that we've been doing for a long time. So let's look at the simplest example. I'm a botanist, forgive me. Uh, so I go out in the field and I grab a plant and I bring that plant, well, I, I mean to the plant, I squish it first, and then I bring it back. And if it seems reasonable through a set of processes, it will make it to be a herbarium specimen. Easy, right? Yes, but what if you're an entomologist? Then it gets a little more complicated. So now I have a malaise trap. This is part of the Swedish malaise trap project. What do I do? Ooh, I collect a whole bunch of stuff in alcohol called a lot. But then I have to do something with that. So painstakingly, I pick through all those bugs and I categorize them somehow, however I want. Probably they end up something like this, yet again in more and more vials with identifiers or some kind of data and I move on. So let's generalize that a bit, okay? Here's the, there's the lot over there, which has some beetles and I've collected them in that malaise trap. That collect process is the event. There's a whole bunch of data associated with that, which you know about, that's the collecting event. We have all kinds of data that we put there. What do I do next? Well, if I'm me, I really like the white ones. So I subsample a white one. And I look at that carefully and I try to determine what it is. I put a determination on it. The other stuff, well, it sits in that other lot. Then what do I do? Well, then I wanna know a little more. So I am mean, I take off a leg, I subsample it uh, and I extract it and I go through a molecular process to generate some kind of molecular identification, which may or may not agree with the other one. All right, let's get even more complicated. So now I have a biological relationship between two different entities. I'm actually not interested in the plant. I'm interested in the galls that are on the plant. These are rose galls. So I collect both entities together. They have one event, but then I'm gonna split them because I want the rose to end up in the herbarium as the reference as the host that the botanist might be more interested in. I want to learn from them, but I also want to rear those gulls so I can figure out what the wasps are, which I do, and they come out nicely at different emergence times, and then they live on with their own metadata, and I'll say more about that a little later. All right, so what are the challenges here? Well, the obvious is that we all do different things depending on what our research is, so we all have our specific requirements, and those lead to specific workflows. The research isn't based only on those preserved specimens. There's a lot of relationship things going on here between physical things and between observations, for instance. So we have living things that we wanna know something about. We may even maintain them living, who knows? We have those aggregated uh, cases like that gall. We're doing a lot of subsampling these days because we're interested a lot of times in these molecular 
examples, especially things like environmental sampling. And we're taking off parts for various reasons. We're generating derivatives, and then we're doing something to those derivatives. So we're generating a lot of complex relationships, and the challenge is to maintain and preserve not only those physical objects and their data, but the data about those relationships. We don't want those to go away. And those of us who are interested in that usually call this provenance. We don't want to lose the provenance. I'm gonna skip a bunch of this, but I wanna say that the collection object provenance, which we're gonna focus on a bit here, there are some important points about it. So we want it to be able to accommodate for incomplete and revised knowledge because we're always adding. So we have to have the flexibility to add knowledge in the places where it makes sense. And it has to stay separate. We do not delete what was there and put in the new stuff, right? That's a bit old school and we should not do that. Uh, so we wanna be extensible for new properties. Who knows what the next gadget is that will allow us to do something cool. So we have to make sure it's flexible enough to allow us to try new things and to capture whatever data or metadata we need. We also wanna be anchored to a domain independent conceptual model. And why do we wanna do that? The core of that is because we want to be able to interoperate, we want to be able to integrate data across those domains. Some of that is underpinned by the reason we're here, standards. And we want it to be shareable using digital or federated information technology. What does that mean? We wanna be able to reuse it somehow. So, Colleagues and I have been playing around for a few years now. We, well, I should say we kind of played for a while and now we're more into the implementing part, but we've been working on a new software called Dina. It's actually a collaboration. It's meant to be a collaboration. Anyone can join our consortium. We work together. Uh, and so we're building this collection management slash research management software set, which has a new kind of data model underpinning it and just some new interfaces that work with that model. And you'll see some of that now. It's open source, of course, it's community driven, uh, and it's modern in the sense of it has a mod modular um, application architecture or web services, some of us would call that, uh, driven by APIs, which makes sense in this day and age. What does it look like? Well, I can't show you at all. I don't have that kind of time, but here's a little snapshot of the interface. And what I can say is we do have a demo up that you're welcome to try. Uh, we try to keep it up to date as well as up, uh, which is a challenge on our infrastructure sometimes. But uh, here this allows you to play around a bit, get a, get a feel for what the model is like. And if, uh, if you need to remember that, uh, I can make it available to you in person as well. So what does this mean? What are we talking about in the sense of the data model? All right, five minutes, so I'm gonna move my button. Okay, um, in the sense of the data model, we're talking about objects and processes that link those objects. So this is the model that we had before. You can see the things in blue are the objects and the yellow are those processes through subsampling or derivatives. So in this case, we're dealing with material samples. We decided that the way to generalize the model was to use material samples. Hopefully many of you are at least somewhat knowledgeable about material samples. Maybe you've been participating in the crazy discussions going on about material samples that are still not finished. But anyway, I encourage you if you don't. So these are physical entities that's under some kind of, well, we call it human custodianship for lack of better words, for some period of time. That time can be very short, but some period of time. They encompass both preserved or living biological specimens and other interesting things like minerals and tissue samples and ice cores. So it's very general. It has an independence, independence of the composition, the preservation state, all that stuff. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's just a sample. It's the process that drives the, the data, the metadata. And uh, you can specify subclasses as you need them. So you can break it down as much as you want. You can stay high, and go low. So let's look at just a couple examples. This is the simplest example of the one that I gave at the very beginning. There I am collecting my rows in this case. I have all that collecting event data. That is one material sample. That material sample is a whole organism. I put it on a preparation type, which is a herbarium sheet, and it has some kind of ID, and it maintains a primary ID, which I can then, because I may split things off this at some point. What happens if I get splitty? Well, it gets messy, but not really that messy. So now I'm collecting one thing in the field again. I'm taking a large rubus specimen, blackberry or raspberry, and I'm same idea. I have all that collecting event stuff, but this time the parent doesn't survive. Interesting, huh? 
the parent is destroyed because I break it into five separate material samples. I have a couple of that I become herbarium sheets. So I define a preparation type and I have one at the bottom that is a different type. It's a fruit, it's freeze dried. And you can see it ends up in a different place, storage. And so all of this connects through a provenance. I, I can keep track of that organism no matter what I do to either part at any time, I can always trace back. Here's the example of the uh, bug again, the beetle that I ripped the leg off of. You can see these are preparations. And in this case, it's an organism because we're gonna define that as an organism part. We're taking a part of the organism off, we're sequencing it, and it has some history to it. That history may or may not agree with the morphological answer. In this case, it does not. But it's your decision as a taxonomist what to make of that. What happens with the gall? The gall, you separate the two things into their different entities. So the herbarium specimen goes that way. And the gall is reared, it emerges, and those emergents are organisms. So these organisms are tied back to that material sample and also remain tied to the plant. So you never lose the provenance of the event itself that happened over here, even though it's biologically complex and stored in very different collections. What about the environmental sample idea? This is a case of growing something in a greenhouse. You have a host plant. You don't care about the host plant. It's only there because you care about the fungi, because you're actually interested in the soil, and you're going to do environmental samples of the soil. In that case, you can define associations. So the plant is, is ephemeral. We, you don't really care, but you need to know what it was. And then you tie that to the long list of whatever you get from blending up your, uh, your soil. And you may be interested directly in things. So you may have targets or you may not. So what's the conclusions of this? This is still a work in progress very much, but material samples as a core concept really works. It gives you a lot of flexibility and uh, that allows us to tackle these more difficult research use cases, which have been challenging to us for a long time. And keeping track of that object provenance is very valuable. So you have that history. It doesn't matter what you, know, what you derive. And it's a best practice in science because we want rep reproducibility. And those of you who work in the areas where you have um, any kind of regulation, well, you have a history. You can always define what you did. And finally, you know, there's software and services and these standards. We feel like we have a lot of this covered, but in the sense of provenance, we still have some work to do as a standards body, I think, in order to, uh, to better model or better represent the objects. So I just want to say in a final acknowledgement here that uh, that data model was jointly derived by uh, the Museum for Natural Kunde, my colleagues there and, and us. Uh, the interface that you see was actually produced by uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food, so a great team of us uh, that we put together, uh, funded by a big project called Biomob. And thank you very much. Now, no questions for me because we have discussion time later. Uh, and the next one, do we know if she's live or not? Okay, so Teresa is not live, but she will be joining the discussion uh, so we can play the video. Thanks. Hello and thank you. Thank you for being here today. Let's talk about potential changes for Darwin Core and the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, or GBIF, publishing model, and their relationship to collection management systems. I feel like I am standing at a crossroads summoning a demon, but here goes. First, let's touch on GBIF's unified model, which was or will be discussed in this symposium. The new model recognizes that biodiversity data are more complex than just the occurrence of species in time and space, and is looking toward the aggregation of data such as automated monitoring, biotic interactions, and environmental measurements. In addition, the model expects to address an issue collections have known about for a long time, that we need improved handling of data representing material. 
The new GBIF model is being tested and matured to accommodate real data sets, and I was able to participate in this as part of the Arctos data test case. In conjunction with GBIF's planning, it just so happens that TADWIG convened a new task group last year to address physical objects. I am the convener of the task group. We are making progress toward a proposal for a clarification of the Darwin Core material sample class with its own properties and expect the outcome of this process to be a standard for sharing more complete information about biological specimens, including their physical properties and associations with each other, organisms, and research products. As we began our work, there was quite a bit of philosophizing but we settled on the need to first achieve a clear conceptual delineation between the terms material sample, preserved specimen, living specimen, and fossil specimen. We determined that preserved, living, and fossil specimen are all just types of material sample, and that we likely don't need four classes of the same general thing. So we have focused on material sample as the most broad term of the four. We have worked to give that term a better definition and on a recommendation for the other three terms, recognizing that they will need to be considered as we develop material sample type. This is still a work in progress, and we are trying to be mindful of the potential opportunities the new GBIF model may afford and the fact that many will choose to continue publishing under the current model. The Darwin Core material sample term and GBIF's material entity fit well. Given this, the material sample task group realized that identifiers will be crucial in the new GBIF data model and that material will benefit from good ones. We are also mindful of the fact that as the occurrence class has been expanded over time to include material type descriptions, some terms may need review and may need to be organized as properties of material sample. Finally, we recognize that some new terms may be needed. The ability of GBIF to handle richer material data and a beefed up material sample class in Darwin Core will combine to create both challenges and opportunities for collections managing material data. Let's look at some challenges. Challenge number one, stop thinking about objects as occurrences and start thinking about objects as participating in occurrence events. Museums have been forcing their object information into occurrences to meet the needs of GBIF, when the occurrence or collection event is really just the first event in the life of a museum object. We are now conditioned to think of the data about our objects as occurrence data, and changing this thought process will be challenging. Not to mention the challenge of mapping data that has sometimes been formatted specifically to meet the GBIF occurrence standard to something new and far more descriptive. Challenge number two, what's a material sample? We don't generally accession individuals or objects that we don't plan to keep forever. The image on the left is of a mouse before or perhaps as it was being collected. Is this a material sample or an organism that results in a material sample? In this case, the object cataloged is a whole organism preserved in ethanol with the catalog number MBZ MAM 23964. So it's kind of both. But things commonly come and go. The image on the right is a raccoon after its collection and preparation for storage in a museum collection. In this case, the objects catalog include a study skin, skeleton, and frozen samples of heart, liver, kidney, and muscle. All of these parts share the catalog number DMNS MAM 16640. Is the material sample the original whole organism or the preserved parts created later? After a lot of discussion, the Tadwig Material Sample Task Group decided that an organism may be a material sample, but a material sample does not necessarily need to be an organism, which means the answer is it depends. But this also ties in to challenge number three. Material samples are better with good identifiers. In most museum collection catalogs, there is a mix of single things with a catalog number and multiple things that share a number. As the data gets extended and the various objects sharing a number get used in different ways, it starts to become clear that each thing needs an identifier, and not just any identifier. 
If we are going to realize the extended digital specimen and make the best use of GBIF's new data model, objects will benefit from globally unique and persistent identifiers. Minting these forever identifiers at every stage is burdensome and probably just adds confusion. So the challenge is, when do we assign these and how will they be maintained? But remember, we will also need good identifiers for the collections these objects are housed in, the events these objects participate in, the people who interact with them, the taxa they represent, and well, the bottom line is that everything will need good identifiers, and this is very much a broader community challenge. Which brings me to challenge number four, acceptance and use. Extending specimen data and aggregating under GBIF's new data model will likely require some social engineering. Collection managers will need to get used to working with new kinds of identifiers, potentially minting them, and instructing others to use them properly. This means that curators and people who use materials will need to support something other than the traditional catalog numbers being used in things like publications and even in the collection itself. It also means that publishers will need to support and potentially require non-traditional identifiers if we ever hope to trace research results back to the objects that created them. This is an even broader community challenge, requiring the participation of everyone involved in the chain of information related to these objects. But enough about the challenges, let's look at some opportunities. The biggest opportunity for physical collections provided by GBIF's new model and an enhanced group of properties for Darwin Core material sample class lies in the ability to showcase and track the objects we care for in an aggregation. It also lets them showcase all of the details and information that we know about these objects in a way that lets researchers filter and select the objects appropriate for whatever it is they are doing. The second opportunity afforded by the new GBIF model is the ability to tell your own story. With the current GBIF Darwin Core archive, which is flat and focused, there is one entry point and one story to tell. Given normalized data, anyone can hop in from anywhere and tell their own story. For example, you can build yourself a publication-centric picture and treat the dead rats like secondary metadata. Opportunity number three is like magic. It involves connectivity, most of which gets lost in the occurrence model, but can be allowed to shine in a post-occurrence approach. Links to information will appear in the new data model. Someone publishes a bunch of genetic sequence data that uses your material sample identifiers. GBIF can match these and yay, everyone. Anyone can now follow the chain of information from specimen collection to genetic sequence and even from collector to researcher. This is where IDs that are or can be made into URLs of some form can do stuff. A bit more investment results in a lot more functionality like this Crossref example, which exists because DOIs can be magicked into URLs. So now we return to challenge number four, which for me is also an opportunity. Connecting our data in a rich mesh of knowledge will require community support and participation. Support for collection managers and the systems they use to maintain the knowledge and support for all of the players who help make connecting data possible. We all need to work together to create systems and processes that work for everyone. We will all have to make compromises in a connected and vibrant community of biodiversity data providers, publishers, users, and standard setting bodies. But in the end, that will result in better outcomes for everyone. So from the crossroads, I say thank you to Dusty McDonald, the Arctos programmer for his enthusiasm, John Vichorek for his experience, Tim Robertson for his patience, the Tadwig Material Sample Task Group for their time and attention, the Arctos community for their commitment to collaboration, and thank you for listening.
the next one's also a good quote. So this is coming from John and Tim on diversifying the GBIS data model. Hello, and thank you for being here today. Let's talk about potential changes for Darwin Core and the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, or GBIF, publishing model, and their relationship to collection management systems. I feel like I am standing at a crossroads summoning a demon, but here goes. First, let's touch on GBIF's unified model, which was or will be discussed in this symposium. The new model recognizes that biodiversity data are more complex than just the occurrence of species in time and space, and is looking toward the aggregation of data such as automated monitoring, biotic Hi, I'm John Vichorek, and my co-author is Tim Robertson. Our presentation today is going to provide an introduction to work underway to enrich the data model that underpins the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, or GBIF. As of today, there are a limited number of scientific questions that can be answered using GBIF-mediated data. This is in part due to the use of a simplistic model built around the notion of a species occurrence, that is, where and when representatives of a taxon have been collected or observed and the accompanying evidence. We're exploring how to increase the diversity of questions that can be answered through the GBIF network. And an important way to do this is to engage more communities. The broader scenario is to enable GBIF to cover deeper and richer data. By deeper, we mean that there would be more relational complexity. By richer, we mean that there would be the capacity to include additional information about any of the supported concepts, including assertions, roles played by agents, citations, and identifiers. All of this to better serve those with the capacity and desire to represent the original data faithfully, while still supporting the existing data publishing paradigms, such as ABCD and Darwin Core with its extensions. All the latest information about the project will continue to be accessible from the web page shown on this and the following slides, including the presentations and video recordings from previous webinars. Work began in 2021 using an approach that includes working with communities on specific use cases, many of which are represented here. This case study approach allows us to explore specific concerns and test them by integrating them into the larger aggregated conceptual model. For each case study, we solicit or draft a narrative that describes a novel problem, and then develop and test the data model that satisfies the case. As new cases are introduced, we extend or refine an aggregated model to accommodate needs that were not yet met. Distinct case studies are at different levels of maturity, with those relating to specimens now being the most well advanced. Our work to date has touched on all of the event based concerns expressed in the presentations in this symposium multi species occurrences, identifiers and shared data scenarios, specimens, material samples and their derivatives, and biotic interactions. Our goal is to make sure that these will all be addressed rigorously in the unified model. Here we show a structural representation of the GBIF Unified Model as an Entity Relationship, or ER, diagram. This represents the integrated conceptual model that has arisen from the treatment of various use cases covered to date and is current as of 9 September 2022. In this short presentation, we'll only look at how this model is built around events for a specific case related to specimens in the broad sense of material taken from its original context and will highlight a couple of aspects of the larger model. Keep in mind that this diagram really only shows the basic elements that define the conceptual model and does not include all of the possible fields or terms that it might apply to each of the concepts. Also keep in mind that most boxes shown here can be connected to auxiliary data, such as additional identifiers, the roles of agents, and assertions, such as measurements, facts or other observations. I mentioned that the unified model is built around the central concept of an event. Every event represents an action at a place during a period of time following some protocol with some objective of interest, whether that is a target or a result. 
Now, there are many possible kinds of events, the type of which is expressed in the field event type. We'll use the example of a collecting event. So, for example, an insect, which is some organism in the model, which in turn is one of several types of entity in the model, could be target of a malaise trapping protocol executed during a survey, which is yet another event, the parent of the collecting event. That insect could be used to make a museum specimen, a material entity in the model, or material sample if you prefer, potentially via another event with another protocol if you choose to track to that level of detail. At the same or some later time, another material sample, a material entity in the model, might be taken from the insect specimen for the purpose of extraction of, sequencing of, and identification from DNA. All of this could be optionally expressed as separate events with their protocols, assertions, and agent roles. Having repeated the exercise of modeling around an event-based core across many use cases, we have assembled some bits of wisdom that we believe indicate a certain writing on the wall of what will come from the adoption of the unified model as an internal model at GBIF for aggregated data from diverse disciplines and sources. The most profound lessons we have learned so far are that a hierarchical event-based model is powerful and versatile. An open-ended way of expressing relationships between entities makes the scientific capacities much easier to add. Identifiers are key. Okay, I couldn't help putting in a geeky joke. They're everywhere. They enable every concept to take on global significance and are the glue that binds concepts together to enable questions to be investigated. Controlled vocabularies are the main ingredient that will allow users of the data to find what they're looking for and be assured that they've found what they needed. We think that the results will be worth the effort. The unified model should make publishing new types of data much more agile, more robust, and more amenable to community participation. This has been just a quick exemplary overview. If you'd like to understand the unified model in more detail, we invite you to investigate the two webinars given to date. The first one was an introduction to the project, the process, and the original formulation of the unified model. The second webinar was a deep dive into a sophisticated specimen collection and management system, ARCDOS, showing how deep and rich data can be preserved in publication to the unified model. Also, be attentive for upcoming webinars, which will cover additional deep dives into how data integration in the unified model can be done for other use cases. Having already tested much of this model with a handful of records from the ARCDOS collection management system, see webinar two, we will now aim to test on a much wider scale. Following an open call for applicants, which has just closed, we'll now begin testing the model even more comprehensively with data originating from many different collection management systems and collection types. The results will solidify the specimen-related aspects of the unified model and will be the subject of a webinar in the future. With Tim, I'd like to thank you very much for inviting us to participate in this symposium and give this brief update. You're welcome, John. Uh, and John is with us online, um, so that is good, as is Teresa and uh, Tim. And David Shorthouse is also online, and he's going to help out. Um, but before I move on, I also wanted to acknowledge my two very helpful helpers, uh, Shelly and Holly. Uh, special shout out to Holly, who took the time to capture uh, the chat and move it over into the Slack uh, so that we preserve what those questions were and what the discussions were. Those of you who are following that this morning, there was some pretty provocative stuff floating by, somewhat philosophical, I must say. Um, and I mean, I think in some ways, some of this is nice because it's moving past philosophy into closer to implementation phases, uh, which is nice. It's been a long time coming. The discussions are great. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier for material samples. I mean, if you, if you look at that thread, Rich, I look at Rich, uh, <laughs> there's some very uh, 
interesting statements and great discussions going on there. And I think that's what we have to do. That's how we move forward. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, I think what I'd like to do is first address questions to speakers. So if there's anything from this morning or this afternoon where you specifically want to target a question to one of the speakers, we can do that for a little while. And then we'll talk more generally about implications of what we've seen, gaps, what, what's interesting, what's not interesting. Um, so questions for either from online uh, or in the audience here, I'll try to manage that. Um, and Rich has already got his hand up. Okay, go Rich. Uh, and you have to come and use the microphone. Um, Richard Pyle, Bishop Museum. My question is for you, James. Oh. Um, so you touched on something that I've been wrestling with and I just wanted to get general guidance from you and you've thought about this. So you talked about how the parent-child relationship and material samples, subsamples and whatnot, sometimes the parent survives and maintains its integrity and sometimes it's obliterated by the fact that the sum of all the subsamples equals what was once the parent. Now, there's an entire spectrum of, of possibilities there. So like the example I give is you have a fish and you take a fin clip off of it. And, and so the fish probably maintains its material sample miss as it originally was as the parent, the fin clip becomes the child. And then the example you gave is where essentially you've parsed it out into so many pieces. No one of them stands out as preserving its original parent nature. My question is, have you thought about how you could provide guidance to people on where that threshold is, whether one of the entities maintains its original status and the rest are derivatives versus the original parent is now no longer extant and only the children live on? And the reason I ask that is because we've kind of left it at, well, it's up to the collection manager or the data manager or whatever to make that call. And that's fine. And that's probably the only true answer. But if there was at least like a white paper or guidance or just subsections, then we might get a little more consistency across our community about making that determination of the parent lives on versus the parent is no longer lives on. It's been replaced by the sum of its derivatives. So that's kind of my question to you. I don't know if you. So, uh, oh, you have to keep that away from me. Sorry. <laughs> I have the second set on. Um, so yes, but I would say it's early days, right? The trouble with having a data model that is very flexible is that it's very flexible. So it allows people to model things in different ways. And whereas that can be good, it also relies, I think, on those best practices. It, it relies on guidance and documentation. Uh, and so actually David is closer to that, being the person who's responsible for um, you know, the migration of that data and, and some of that. So David, I'll give you a chance to uh, say something here. Oh, did he comment already? He can comment live and in person if he wants. Sorry, I've been I've been quiet and shy and just listening. Um, I, you said it better than I could, James. It's early days, <laughs> but I just put in some a comment in the chat here uh, as a, as an extension to Rich's thought. Um, this parent-child relationship becomes really interesting when you're talking about living collections. What about bacterial cultures? Well, there's really no parent-child relationship in the same sort of way that we have with a beetle and its leg. Um, and so that kind of relationship really doesn't become hierarchical in the same sort of way. It becomes more like a mesh, if that makes any sense. Any back commenting, Rich? Oh, uh, no, I mean, I think I agree. I'm totally on the early days thing. I guess what I was just saying is this is something that has no obvious pathway to an answer in my mind. And so as long as you're thinking about it, as you move from early days into medium days, as long as it's in your radar, and obviously it is, then I'd like to hear more about what you guys come up with on it. Oh, can you read that, Rich? When is this distinction actually important in items and inferences we can draw and cannot draw? I don't know yet. That's a really good question. It may be a moot point, but I do know that when, you know, as one of the early adopters of a, a material sample-based model for collections, we bumped into this and tried to decide how to make that decisions. And on, you know, Tuesdays, I decided to do it one way and Fridays, I decided to do another. And that, that seems way too arbitrary. 
And so I, I would like to find out if people who've encountered this as well have started thinking about some sort of decision. And, and it actually relates to what I talked about this morning about tax on concept circumscriptions. How precise do you want the circumscription to be? You could think of uh, a, a, you know, a material sample lot as being the circumscription of its sub, you know, parts and then the, a specimen being the circumscription of all of its deri derivative parts too. And at what point do those concepts need new identifiers um, I don't know how practical that's a problem is going to be, but I can tell you it is a practical problem in the taxonomy world. So it's probably going to be one in the material sample world too. Thanks. And the only reason I'm moving up here is because I am the source of that interference, which is very annoying. <laughs> um, there is another question in the chat, which I think David, again, is best to answer from Tim. David, do you see that question in the chat from Tim? Oh, it's in Slack. Okay, Holly will read it to you. <laughs> Thank you, Holly. Um, Tim asks, in Dina, can you clarify when an organism becomes material, please? You're going to have me answer that? <laughs> um, no, I, that, was a, that was a question I asked of uh, James. Ah, okay. But it's okay. I think David is actually better to answer it than me. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I think, uh, you know, that's a probably a question for the floor. I think in some instances, I mean, um, um, Teresa uh, addressed that really well in her presentation. In some instances, uh, an organism and a material are synonymous. They're one and the same, but in other instances, not. So I, I don't know how best one would clarify that, uh, except perhaps if in the way that Teresa has uh, thought about a material sample type, whether that has some bearing on how we would think of that relationship to what is the organism. Because, you know, in, in some instances, a material sample will be, uh, well, its constituent parts will have perhaps thousands of organisms. In other instances, they're one to one. Um, Christian has his hand raised. Okay. So. Christian, do you want to go? Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, well, um, probably this question has many, many different facets, but um, I would say that in Dina, the notion of a material sample, um, as, as, you, as, you pre, um, as you presented it, James, um, I think it's important to bear in mind that this is a very general concept and you have to choose some term to talk about this concept and material sample really is used as a technical term that um, incorporates also biological individuals, life individuals or individuals that are clearly dead and preserved and um, it should really be seen as a technical term that enables us to um, represent object histories across these boundaries of what is still is a, an, an, um, an, uh, um, a biological individual that has integrity or is just a part of a biological individual and gets preserved um, in some sorts. And for certain questions, it will, I guess it will definitely be very important to determine, are we talking about a live animal um, a live biological individual or not. Um, but the, the biggest benefit of introducing this very, very general class is to be able to represent object provenance across these divides. Thank you, Christian. Uh, okay, let's pause that. Is there other questions for uh, speak? Is there anything online or in-house uh, for the speakers? There's another question for Andreas has a question. Do you want me to? Is that the only mic we have? We have Jay James. I think John would like to comment on the, the last topic before you move on. Oh, okay. Well, I'm moving towards Andreas. Go ahead, John. Okay, I'll be quite brief. Um, just to say how we envision it in the unified model. The organism is a distinct type of entity. It's something with some continuity that is distinct from material samples. So as Teresa was describing, an organism in whole at some point in time can become a big material sample. 
That's true. But the organism itself is a thing unto itself with as a separate concept. Does that make sense? We would not say that an organism is a material sample. We would say that the organism was the source of a material sample, which took its entire physical being at some particular time. Thanks, John. Go ahead, Andreas. Uh, <clears throat> Andreas Müller from Botanical Garden Berlin. Uh, it's just a short question about identifiers. And um, so uh, if I summarize you uh, mo in the models that we have seen here, I think uh, the, the core is that we have entities and we have events between them or something that relates them. So you have mentioned the importance of identifiers. Is this only for the entities or material sample or whatever you call it? Uh, or do you also think that the events needs <laughs> identifiers that are actionable, resolvable, etc. Uh, do you have any experience about this? We've definitely talked about this, and it's likely that some parts of the events need identifiers to be trackable, but not all. I don't think we're <laughs> we're in no position to talk right <laughs> about that many identifiers and keeping track of these things. Um, another thing we have talked about is the processes themselves having identifiers, so you know that whatever that process is is repeated in other places or within your own you know, context. You mean the process type? Yes. <laughs> yeah, sure. So there are many things we can put identifiers on. I think this community realizes that we still have an identifier problem and managing those identifiers through time is challenging. Um, but I think we have to start considering uh, where best to begin. Whoever you get to first. Hi, this is Arnal Marcet from Graph. Um, I just wanted to make a, re a general reflection. Uh, the community is in the business of digitizing the world's natural history collections while at the same time learning how to organize all this data. And data models are being improved as time goes by while specimen data keep coming into GBIF. So far, about 200 million specimens have been entered into GBIF. Uh, maybe when the last digitized specimen will be entered into GBIF, it will coincide with the latest version of the data model. So if things are not already complicated, uh, should we already also be devising a way to updating the already digitized data? Uh, well, this is just a general comment, but a, a thought that I had that we may reach the end of digitizing a finite, finite collection of specimens and at the same time be all of it obsolete with respect to the data model. I don't know if John or... I think or that's Tim a John or a Tim. Thank you. I'll, I'll take a, a first pass of that, if, if I may. Let me just start my video. Thank you for the question. The, the, the model work that we are doing in all of our presentations before today, we have always repeated that publishing models that have worked so far will continue to work for GBIF. So we see this as a way of um, making it possible to share richer data but anyone who's already built processes and pipelines in place that use the, the current data models, all of that data will still be um, available and, and mapped into this, this integrated structure. So um, it, it's not that it would become obsolete. This would allow those who want to, to provide richer information. Thanks, Tim. And, and I, I'd like to say, I think that's exactly what we need to do. I mean, we can't stop. We, you know, we used a flattened, simple Darwin core for a reason, right? And that still has very good reason. It's just that in biology, those of us who are you know, out there and studying, biology is all about relationships and, and flattening out the data and losing those relationships or not necessarily losing them, but making them more awkward 
uh, to understand or, or based on more assertion than we might want is problematic for the science. We, we wanna move the science forward. And so we can experiment with these new models while we maintain consistency. And I, I think that's a key point that Tim made. All right, there was more questions in the back and I, I'm assuming for online, let me know if. Go ahead, Walter. Thanks, James. My name is Wout Adding from uh, Naturals Biodiversity Center in the Netherlands and also uh, from uh, the DISCO Research Infrastructure. Um, first of all, I think that the, all the work that's being done currently in Petwick uh, regarding the material samples uh, is a big step in the right direction. Uh, but I would like to point out two things. One uh, is that um, I think that a material sample is not one to one the same as a specimen. Um, sometimes a specimen is not a material sample and sometimes uh, a material sample is not a specimen. And we have in our museum um, systems that uh, are um, meant for management of, of uh, specimens. So um, if we are going to further develop uh, material samples, um, we need to, uh, to point out the, the relationships with, with, with specimens. Otherwise we uh, introduce a problem, I think, with the, uh, the current uh, systems that are based on, on, on specimen creation. Um, and the other thing that I would like to point out is that um, in order to fully, uh, and, uh, oh, and, uh, it's uh, the same uh, with, with, uh, with the, uh, the GBIF uh, new data model. Uh, it's not very entirely clear whether a material sample and a material entity uh, in the new uh, GBIF model is exactly the same or a material sample is a subset of that. Uh, the other thing I would like to point out is that uh, if the material sample is meant to going to support the, the concept of the distal extended specimens, um, in this goal, we believe that uh, to, to establish the extended specimen concept, it will be very uh, important to have uh, identifiers uh, that are machine actionable. There are a special kind of identifiers. We call them PIDs. Uh, they are globally unique. Uh, they are, uh, have a social structure in place to make them persistent. They are resolvable and um, they uh, provide some metadata that make them actionable for machines. Um, and I think it would be good uh, to introduce uh, a, a Darwin core concept to support this special kind of uh, identifiers for machine for future machine actionability, which is especially important for uh, establish these uh, these extended uh, specimens uh, where where all the relationships with uh, with extended information needs to be uh, made. Thanks, Walter. Those are important points. I mean, I think going back to your, your first point, Teresa did you know, a reasonable job of talking about material samples and what the current sort of community concept is of material samples and material sample type. This isn't nailed down yet. Uh, that discussion still goes on. I'm looking forward to seeing the presentation from Teresa that says, here's what we have. Uh, but, and I think it's close. Uh, I really feel like it's close. And once we have that, then of course, we'll understand that relationship better about her between what is a specimen and a material sample uh, and material entity. I mean, we, the trouble is of course, is that that community is broader than us. And so we, we have to pay attention and listen to a broader uh, community than just us in, in defining these terms or reusing these terms. Thanks. If anybody online wants to say something, please go ahead. Could, could I say something? Um, Walter, well, well, thanks for that. Uh, what the, the, the approach we've taken for the, the new data model at GBIF is to capture problems as case studies. And you've said that you've got concerns of how material is appearing in that, that model um, with relation to, to specimens. Can, can we try and document um, something that, that explains the problem in a way that we can then think about adapting the model to cover it. Um, is that something that you could help us uh, draft, please? Sorry, I know you don't have the mic, but uh, you, perhaps that's, you don't need to answer that in the room, but we, we would like to work with you to, to document that problem a little bit better. All right, 
please, sir, go ahead. Hello, Guillaume Body from the French Agency of Biodiversity. Uh, one of the beauty of the emergence of the event core is the ability to nest an event into another one, the parent uh, event ID. Um, it has been accepted for the assertion as well to have a parent ID that appears in a few tables. And uh, it's a very uh, useful uh, notion to just have uh, on the same kind of record a parent and to be able to nest records in each other, to be able to zoom in. It could apply for the for the material sample, for the raccoon example, where you have a subsample of one material and you have ribs of a raccoon. Uh, you can have the same for groups and individual groups. Uh, are you going to generalize this uh, parent ID? Thank you for that. And I, I believe that's going to be a John Lashorek question. Talking about the events in the model. Yeah. Um, the events are hierarchical events. Like I said, we're powerful and versatile. And what's going to happen, I believe, is that we're going to have to be very diligent about working on, on the type vocabulary. First of all, by adding an event type term. And second of all, you being a community to try to figure out what the at least very high level event types are. So you might have collecting events, you might have very specific types of collecting events. Those might be parts of ecological surveys, et cetera, et cetera. The, the, cost of versatility is the expense of defining this type vocabulary in a way that allows people to get at the questions they really want and to have everybody doing it the same way. So I think we're going to have a shift of emphasis toward a lot of work on type vocabularies, which has to be a very broad community exercise. Thanks, John. Other questions? I should ask, is there, are there any questions flying by in the chat or the Slack? Many questions? Uh, oh, Christian has his hand up. Okay, go ahead, Christian. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the, the, this, this actually um, uh, goes back to what you said last, James, um, about the um, about the terms uh, material sample and specimen. And um, also the chat makes clear that um, in different communities of practice, these terms, they are loaded with meaning and um, uh, possibly very different meaning. And uh, I think when we want to go forward, then we need to see past these terminological differences and really rely on clear definitions and um, make sure that um, in our discussions, in our information systems, um, we're always, um, well, we're always clear on what concept we're actually after. So in DINA, we've been using material sample in a very, very broad sense. And um, so maybe we need to reconsider this because it is just too much um, work to, um, or too difficult to place this term against traditional uses of these terms. Um, but again, we first, I think, uh, or one, one step in this exercise will be to really understand how these terms are used in different communities of practice. Thanks, Christian. Well said. I mean, this is a work in progress, so... Uh... <laughs> Anyone else? Questions uh, from this audience? There is lots of stuff if you're looking at it in the Slack and the, and the uh, chat going by about terminology mostly. Um, but anybody uh, confused, desperate, uh, want, wanting to know more? You have a bunch of the uh, experts here. Hi, I'm Rick Levy from Denver Botanic Gardens. And I'm just wondering in practice, should we, once we go this route, 
do existing occurrence IDs then shift to be under material sample ID if it was a, a specimen based occurrence? And how do we, I guess, practically make this change? Is the data itself changed or is it just duplicated into this new, this new standard? So I'm going to give that to John and Tim again to talk about the relationships of occurrence. I can take that. <clears throat> occurrence is a problematic concept. In everything that we've looked at so far, an occurrence isn't really a, a thing. <laughs> it's a combination of things. It's an action that happened, and it's the evidence that resulted, and it just flattens things out in a convenient way that a row for a specimen or an observation can fit in a spreadsheet. In our new model, there is no such thing as an occurrence ID. And then I hear gasps from the crowd. It's like, we did all this work to create occurrence IDs. What is this going to mean? Well, in, in our unified model, it's just a join between an event and the things that, that resulted from it. And specifically, I, don't, I can't really bring up the model here conveniently to show where this sits, but basically an occurrence is in a table that we call an entity event. It's, it binds the things that resulted from an event with the event that spawned it. And that those occurrence IDs that we have really in practice function for specimens, which means that if they have value, for example, they've been published somewhere, they're probably more useful for the material that resulted from an occurrence, some, like a collecting event, than they are for anything else. Not for the event, not for the organism or anything else. They are for the stuff that resulted from an event. That's my guess right now. So, but we haven't really done anything with the occurrence IDs to maintain them, to put them in a spot. Um, though our, we are confident that the model can maintain them as legacy identifiers for samples, for material entities. I do have another question if I can. Oh, please. That. So ahead. earlier it was mentioned like nesting um, of events. Would that mean that, because I noticed that location ID can fall under an event. So a it's like a one to many, there could be one, or excuse me, so a location, there can be one location for an event essentially. Um, but if you're doing something like an ecological survey, you might have a whole set of coordinates. I guess what I'm getting at here is why is the, why is the date or the time a range when and location may or may not be? Teresa has her hand up, but I have an answer if Teresa is not answering that question. Yeah, no, go ahead, John. Okay, um, in, in our model, at least, location ID is a, basically a foreign key in the event table. What it's saying is that location is important. And location isn't a point, it's not a coordinate, it's a place, and place can have extent. It can also have uncertainty about our knowledge of its extent. So going back to a question that arose in the chat way early on, what is an event? For us, it's an action. It's an action that can be specified at a place as narrowly or more as specifically as required or as broadly as required at a time which can be very specific or very broad <clears throat> with potentially protocols or what was done at that time, and then add all kinds of other stuff around it. But it's basically an action at a place and time with a protocol. Then as you're saying, the hierarchy of it, hierarchy of it, hierarchy of it, putting, having compassing events, 
So a survey could be larger in location because it includes lots of places where the survey was conducted, each of which is an event in and of itself, each of which can have collecting events inside of that. So basically it's, it's the broader view of actions that happened within the duration and place of the bigger event. That's how parents would work. Sounds great. Thanks, John. Go ahead, Teresa. So uh, I'm gonna take it back to the kind of first question about what happens with these occurrence IDs. Um, and, and it's part of what I talked about in my presentation is I think for many collections, they've been substituting their material sample identifier as an occurrence identifier. And so there's gonna be a little bit of grappling with um, what do we do now? Um, and I think it's probably gonna be kind of collection by collection, people thinking about what's the best way for us to handle this. So it, it may not be easy for everybody. Agreed, and that's, uh, well, I don't know if social is the right word for that, but that is something we have to do as a community. It's, it's uh, <laughs> well, in the business world, they call that change management, uh, but we're going to have to change. Uh, and as was pointed out earlier, we, we need to stay the same. So we, we need that simple path still, but by, I think, defining our terminology, which has been pointed out several times and is coming through the chat a lot, by defining that terminology and then using it to address some of these more complex use cases that we've been talking about, we move the science forward. So there's definitely some learning, there's definitely some gaps. I mean, there's things that we haven't done uh, and, and those challenges are about all of us. Uh, and those challenges are broader than us in many cases. So we have to borrow from others uh, or we have to at least look at what others are doing and decide what to borrow, let's put it that way. Um, so yes, uh, Christian has his hand up. Uh, yeah, thanks. I wanted to quickly comment um, on on the on the notion of occurrence um, or on the relation of the uh, uh, representation in Dina on occurrences, and um, I think um, I think for Dina it is it is quite similar to what John has described, um, but maybe not identical. Um, I don't know, we need to discuss this. Um, I would say um, an occurrence um, is, yes, it's a process with uh, certain properties regarding location and regarding, regarding time and um, uh, properties in terms of um, um, individuals of species that have been implicated as participants in, in that uh, process occurring during a particular stretch of time in a particular region region and um, um, the um, and I would say one benefit of disentangling a material sample or species ID and occurrence ID is that we can better represent how we actually arrive in a chain of inference um, about assertions on occurrences that, that we believe happened in the past. Um, so these chains of inference may rely on totally different artifacts from voucher specimens to photographs to notes in a notebook. Um, and I think one of the great uh, benefits or um, 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 as Teresa put it in her talk, um, one, of, on one of the great possibilities is that we can achieve a better representation how these inference chains are actually um, have worked, how they led us to the beliefs that we hold about occurrences of species in the past or in different parts of the, of the world. And, um, and also, uh, this is one, one last remark, um, the concept of parent-child relations um, has invoked um, in, in different respects in this discussion. And I also think this is also one place where I think we need to be more specific um, so sometimes these parent-child relationships, um, they actually mean parthood. In other cases, they mean derivation. And in yet other cases, they may still mean something different. So this is something that I believe um, 
the data models really need to account for instead of um, generic assertions of parent-child relations. Thanks, Christian. Others, comments, questions? Hi, um, Sam Leifman from uh, Disco and Naturalis. Um, I think this one is probably for Tim. Um, I was wondering if uh, the data model is changing. Uh, what does that mean for data exchange? Um, what does it mean for the Darwin Core archives? What are your thoughts on it? Thanks, Sam. Um, we anticipate a a small number of publishing models that GBIF will support. So I, I expect at GBIF we, for the foreseeable future, will still be dealing with data set level exchange. So unlikely to be record by record updates, it's going to be publishing data sets because that is the, the level of publishing that is working well across the global network. Um, like, like we've said, we will likely continue uh, we will continue to support existing publishing models so these we will have additional uh, publishing models different data set structures that gbif support i am aware of course of all of the work you're doing in uh, the disco group and i could imagine that disco could or your system could become a a gateway that's assembling objects into the kind of structure that uh, we've presented today. And as you know, I, I'm involved in, in the discussions around your OpenDS standard. So I, I know that they're fairly compatible. I, I could imagine that, that your system could become a, a gateway for um, collection management systems to, to shape their data into a format that could then be a data set, a snapshot view of that data set that's published in GBIF for global discovery. Um, now, one of the, the questions that, yeah, or the topics that's come up is around identifiers, and you've taken a, a very strong position on the identifiers within your systems. That would solve a lot of the problems for things as they came into to the likes of GBIF and other global aggregators, um, as long as our data models are compatible and we are, we are talking about the same classes of content, things like digital entities, material, um, events, the sites that they were collected from, those kind of things. Does, does that answer your question or were you looking for something a little bit more specific? Yeah, I think and now most of the data going into GRIF is probably coming from the IPTs or our single rows with all the information in there. Um, that probably won't work with nested relationships with parents and child. Um, is, is that the, on the ingestion side, is it, you probably need a richer model uh, at least to, to encompass these, these nested. Yes, you're, you're right. Um, I think in the Arctos example, we ended up with something like 14 tables of data. It, it could have been more, but it, it is a much more normalized model than, um, than the very simple formats that we've had. I think so. Other questions, uh, either in virtual world or here? We have about 10 more minutes. All right. It's me, Rick, again. Um, I'm just wondering what would happen if, and could this be possible if a material sample was somehow assigned to two separate events? And the example I'm thinking of is like, if we're going to old, looking at old museum data, my guess is that people aren't gonna be going through all of this and manually assigning events to things. But if there was some sort of artificial intelligence aggregating and inferring these events based on location and time. And then if a person or a researcher actually went and created an event, like how does one override the other and how would you reconcile such a thing? Or is it just completely not possible and not something to worry about? 
That's an interesting one. Who wants to tackle that? So I will make a random statement about that um, because we deal with this a lot um, in Arctos where sometimes these collecting events are essentially opinions. So for instance, there's a label, it has some place written on it and that's the first event that was recorded. But later somebody comes and geo-references and really to some degree makes a, a personal assessment about that, right? So the coordinates they assign are an opinion. So we keep them both, we send them both to GBIF um, and people can decide between those two which they would prefer to use or which they think is better. Um, at some point, we would hope that there's maybe annotations that help everybody understand, oh, yes, this one's better. Um, but I feel like that's something we're going to have to start dealing with. Thank you. Thanks for these, Polly. Little. Um, so kind of following up on that, I'm curious if we're looking at this event-based model um, and clearly there's a need for it, what do we expect for adoption for this? Um, because it's nice if we can still have multiple modes of publishing and integrating the data, but ideally you would want the different collections to start mapping to the new model. Um, so I'm kind of curious what you expect for implementation. Because I think it will be challenging. We still have trouble getting people to even use our current system. Can I take a stab at that one, please? Go ahead, Tim. Um, it, it's a great point. Um, and it is something that we are very mindful of at GPIF, that uh, we are, especially when you work globally, um, the, the acceptance and understanding of open data is variable. And the um, the, the capacities vary greatly. So we, we need to, to make sure that we have um, we, we, we have a, a spectrum of ways that people can, can, can work with us. And at the simplest form, it needs to be a spreadsheet. It needs to be a very simple way of uh, structuring your data, getting involved in data standards and pushing your data out. Um, what we are trying to do is react to the wishes of people who have already been doing that and have hit the limits of what, what is capable of. So we're now trying to bring in some more richer, more advanced capabilities, but we won't be throwing away the simplicity that is already there at the moment. So like uh, I said, we, we want to keep repeating our mantra that publishing models that have worked to date will, will continue to work. Um, but what we're trying to do is enable those who want to do more to be able to do more. To answer the question of, well, what do we do if we do want to do more? That is why we have, have started working. We had this call and said, who would like to help us test these theories? Um, the call closed last week. We've just done an assessment and we we're about to inform people who, who's, who's going to be involved with us. Um, we're going to be working with a group over the coming months to test some of these data wrangling exercises. So these will be the early adopters. They will help us work through some of these challenges. We will surely learn a ton of stuff going through this process, including how easy is it for people to actually shape this data. One of the things we have learned to date is it is actually easier to shape onto this model than to think about how to denormalize your model into a, a flat sheet for, for some people. But we'll learn a lot through this process. And what will come of that will, will guide us on what we should be putting out as a new model for publishing in the future. This is still a design exercise. It's still a research exercise for us. We haven't got the final solution yet. Thanks, Tim. Oh, got a couple more questions. I'm going to go right to the back. I'm coming. There you go. Name first. Hi, Francesca from the French Biodiversity Agency. 
Um, I have a question about material samples. Um, when, for example, a material sample is extracted from an entity and is analyzed and the resulting um, identification is two species, one that was the entity, the original entity, but then an additional species after analysis, how, how is that um, modeled in, in the material sample table? Teresa, is that you? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Um, yeah, um, so in the, in the, um, when you take a material sample from an entity or an organism that goes away for analysis and returns an identification for another species, let's say uh, a parasite or a virus um, that is additional to the original identification of the material sample, how is that interaction uh, recorded in the model? So I can't speak for what will happen at GBIF, um, but I can tell you um, this is one of those things where previously when we talked about flexible models and how people can choose to do things differently, that um, this is what I've experienced because in some cases, what would happen at that point is, oh, we found this parasite that would be cataloged separately and a relationship made between that parasite and whatever it was found in. Um, in other cases, people may just record both of the identifications on the same record and maybe, you know, note somewhere in the record that this parasite was found. Um, this is where I think a broader community understanding of a best practice would be helpful. And um, it, it's probably going to take a while to get that worked out. I think Yorit um, over at Globe would have something to say about that. But um, right now, I would say there's no perfect one way to do that. Yep. And I would say from the Dina perspective and the way our model is, it's, it's like that, right? There, there are ways you can build those relationships we have a lot of flexibility, but it really comes down to the, that guidance to, to those practices that we want to standardize so that we try to do things that same way. You know, we don't want to lose those relationships. Our, most of my point in the beginning of this was we don't want to lose those relationships. How can we model something? How can we maintain the provenance between material samples, material entities, so that we don't lose those really important biological connections? I'm going to go to Rich because I think he's going to say something on that point, and then we'll switch to you, Walter. Okay. So yeah, I did want to comment on that exact point, which oh, is raises yeah, another like issue. Oh, you need to stay away from me. Sorry. Yes. Um, that I've wrestled with as well. So we talked earlier about the distinction between an organism and a material sample, and one of the, if you look at the definition of what an organism is in Darwin Core, it, it's a it's a taxonomically homogenous thing. In other words, it's 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 it the taxon is part of the organism. So coming to your example um, raises the question: Would one ever identify a material sample to a taxon, or does a material sample inherit its taxonomic identity through an organism instance? Right. And so, do you need these placeholder organism instances in order to derive a taxonomic identification for any particular material sample? I mean, it seems like that's cumbersome, but at the same time, it's, I think, important and powerful, and I may not be explaining it well, um, but in the example you gave, the parasite would be a different taxon th th than, the, than the host. Um, the material sample could have many taxa within it because it could have many organisms within it, but each organism by Darwin core definition can have only one taxon. So essentially the way you would have to handle that is mint another organism instance that has its own taxonomic identity and lump it into that material sample because they were both part of the same material sample. And, and I guess the only thing I wanted people to think about, and maybe there's answers in the room or on the chat, is do we ever want a data model that allows you to attach an identification, a taxonomic identification directly to a material sample, or does that have to flow through an organism. Um, and that's an open question. I don't have my own answer, but I just wanted to raise that. And who was next? 
yes, goes to Valt. I turn around because I think uh, this is a question for Tim, and I hope that you can see me like this. Um, uh, Tim, you mentioned that that, uh, that with the introduction of the new uh, data model, you will also introduce uh, new uh, new publishing models. Um, the Darwin Core standard is our flagship uh, standard in Tedwick, um, and I think that DBIV is the the uh, the biggest uh, user of that that standard. Um, what what would be your advice for the future of 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 Darwin Core? Um, would you see us uh, maintaining us that that further in the future, or is, or is your advice to phase it out uh, after ten years from now, or to um, to embrace the, the new publishing models uh, into a new Tetwick standard and maintain that, or um, uh, uh, to together work on an evolution of the current uh, uh, Darwin Core standard? Uh, what's your vision about that? I think that's uh, an excellent question to ask at this uh, this conference. Thanks, uh, Walter. I, I'm going to ask John to follow up um, what I say with his thoughts, because he is the lead author of Darwin Core. This is at the moment a, a research exercise for GBIF. And we're, we're looking at problems, and we are trying to devise um, a model that would solve the problems that we're, we're seeing, data that people want to put in through GBIF. Um, we, GBIF has been built on open standards from the beginning, and we have always worked with uh, Tadwick as the, the standards body, and that's not going to change. So as this work matures, I anticipate that we will be asking Tadwick um, and working with Tadwick, of course, we all work closely with Tadwick, to um, adopt these and formalize them and put the rigor necessary to turn some of these, this work into formalized standards, which are properly maintained. I don't think we yet know where in Tadwick they should land, whether it should be constrained within Darwin Core or whether this is broader than Darwin Core. And I say that because we're touching on matters that have had a lot of work from other um, groups within Tadwig uh, outside of Darwin Core. So I don't think it's for, for me to make that decision. Um, I'd certainly like to be part of that discussion, but uh, it, it's our intention to find out where in Tadwig this should, this should land as things start sort of solidifying into something we think makes shape or makes sense. John, have you, could I ask you to follow up with what, what I just said, please? Sure. My take is that Darwin Core, what it was really good at and has always been really good at is being a focus for defining terms in a way that can be reusable. The, the bag of terms metaphor that we always used. And we confuse that a lot with the publishing model, which is via Darwin Core archives and the definitions or profiles of terms in the Darwin core that we put together to publish to GBIF, such as an occurrence core or an event core, a taxon core, which are just saying, okay, for the purpose of this particular data set, I would like to assemble these Darwin core terms and share them. The terms, the value of Darwin core for its term definitions, I don't believe will ever go away. The value of Darwin Core archives as a data exchange mechanism is more toward the technical side of things and may be subject to rethinking over time. I want to reiterate what Tim has really tried to hammer home is that there is no intention of trying to make Darwin Core archives go away or occurrence cores go away. So long as they are useful for someone, they're going to continue to exist and be a way to publish data. Where we go with the results of this research, which is a higher level than Darwin Core, I think, of how to put concepts together is, like Tim said, an open question. Does it become a Tadwig ontology the way that an attempt at that was made starting in 2009? Or does it become a more elaborate profile for Darwin Core? I think the former, as long as that makes sense. And making sense is a community decision. It's not a Darwin Core decision or, or any other thing. 
And we don't know the answer to that. And we haven't committed to that. What we're committed to now is making sure that the ideas, the concepts work, that we can share those data, that we can use the aggregated data at every level of complexity to put it all together and answer more questions than GBIF is able to answer now. Do you have an opinion, Wouter? You've been involved in TADWIG for a long time. So I think we're, we're going to wrap up. Thank you to everyone for coming and, and being part of this discussion. As you see, we have a lot of work to do still uh, in much of this. And I mean, I think, I hope that's the exciting part and why all of you are here, uh, but it takes the community, right? It takes broad thinking and it takes many perspectives. The more perspectives we have, the better. And the more use cases we throw at these models, the better. Uh, I think that's the point coming from all of us. So uh, thank you very much again. Thank you online, offline. No, you can't say that. Uh, but what I can say is go and enjoy some dinner. It's six o'clock already. Uh, so thank you.